so uh, <laughs> since you have two films we're going to be talking about, I guess, <laughs> I guess uh, what, what I, I've never had to do this before, so we'll see how it plays out. Ideally, I might ask you about one film, and uh, we'll try and get some questions out with that one, and then hopefully the second film. But if we mix will, and match them, early I will, up. I will keep up. <laughs> so, uh, okay. So, um, which, which uh, you know what? When I ask you the first question, you can just say both films. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that people know who, exactly what two films you're associated with that we're screening. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, uh, we entered two films, uh, and I say we, it's, I work with some of the same crew all the time. Uh, the first film we shot was EPG, mm. and uh, it was great. We had a lot of fun with it. Then we recut it to make it a little shorter and a little tighter, and that's the film that got entered into Something Wicked. The second film we shot is Devil's Food Cake. And I think we got that one right the first time. So that's definitely been entered. All right. So tell me what, what you, tell everyone what exactly you did on each of these films. Oh, I'm sorry. Say, say the question again. Uh, tell everyone uh, exactly what you did for each of these films. What, what right, would you? Well, I am the writer, director, uh, producer one of the producers. And uh, for both films, I did art direction. Um, and uh, to, you know, put it all together, we just took it, I took it from concept all the way through post. I did not edit it. <laughs> um, I had, a, I have a great editor who I've worked with for a long time. And so we have a nice shorthand. I did not score the film. We had, each film had their own composer. Um, and, uh, you know, I did use the same cinematographer, Chris Commons, who was a terrific cinematographer. So, uh, uh, that's everything I did. I like put everybody together just so, uh, <laughs> I put together the right team and the right cast, hopefully. And, uh, you know, we got something good. Okay. Okay. So I, I, ha I have to ask, uh, um, this, um, I think I'm going to start, start with a little bit of EPG, uh, okay. because uh, that one's your sci-fi film, but I like the concepts of that one. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, that's unusual. Uh, tell me how you came up with that idea. Okay, uh, I'll make this into a very short tale, but it's really <laughs> interesting. Um, I always had this idea in my head about people lost in time or uh, somehow a, a maze of time. And uh, uh, I wasn't going to write it. Uh, I was actually prepping Devil's Food Cake. Uh, but uh, a friend of mine who became one of the producers on EPG worked at the uh, Nelson Atkins Art Museum. And he said, have you ever been in the basement of the Nelson Atkins? I said, no. He said, it's very cinematic. And I go, oh, okay. He said, oh, it's like Kubrick cinematic. And I said, all right. Well, he, he was one of the, he was like the, the head of operations. He took me down there. He gave me a tour and it was wild. Um, uh, just endless tunnels. Uh, the, the basement had been built up over decades. So there are a lot of twists and turns and, it was very steampunk and uh, you know, it, it, I said, wow, this is excellent. This is great. I said, if you can get me this location, we'll make a film here. And uh, it took a couple of months, but he finally got approval. And when he did, I set aside a uh, devil's food cake and I created EPG. I took that time story, the, the, the story about the people trapped and I took the location and I matched the story and the location and the characters together and uh, worked out the script. Uh, and that's how I came up with it. Um, it was sort of a marriage of weird concept and actual location. 
Uh, well, I have to admit that the location is key to this film because the story that you just said, you just told us uh, about how you came up with the location. I'm like, wow, that's uh, that's very interesting because that makes up the whole film. Um, but it gives it, you're right, it does give it that like cinematic quality being in a bunch of tunnels. Um, uh, so <laughs> uh, I, I have to know uh, how long did it take you to film this film because you're so, you're in a sense, there's a lot of different angles, but you may be like shooting down three hallways the whole movie. <laughs> uh, I had to go down like five times to scout out every inch of the place. And we had to make our own map. They wouldn't give us a map. <laughs> uh, and, and so we created our own names and uh, for different locations. And just based on that, and I would go down with a camera and just say, okay, what can I do? Uh, you have to block differently for like really long hallways and uh, try to get uh, as much footage as you can out of every scene without, you know, doing a dozen or so setups. Uh, uh, what I uh, what I found out was that uh, um, we could only shoot Mondays and Tuesdays. Okay. The museum was closed Mondays and Tuesdays, and not everybody on the museum, the museum staff knew we were going to be there. So we were taken down into a series of stairwells and tunnels and elevators, like the secret back, back way, and we were locked in. Uh, not we didn't stay overnight, but we were locked in each day. Uh, so two weekends. And then uh, there's an exterior day, and we shot that. So it was a five-day shoot. Okay. Wow. Well, uh, okay. So now I understand why it's called Redo. I was like, why is it called Redo? Uh, but that's okay. I, I, I didn't care about the end of that because I actually enjoyed the film a lot because your two actors but, do a really good job uh, of selling it. <laughs> it's, it's called, okay, my, my, my editor called it, yeah. My, my editor called it Redux because uh, when they came out with the the updated cut of um, uh, oh I can't remember the film oh, no, they called it Redux so he just slapped it on there and I said oh okay and uh, you know it's to me it's still EPG you know we just we just cut a, a, like two minutes out of it so oh that's all that was cut oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking now after we were talking that you like, I mean, I cut, I cut it from an hour to 23 minutes. I cut a lot out of that. Just two no, minutes no, no, was no. all? Okay. <laughs> we just wanted to move a little faster and uh, and we did. So it's, you know, the trims were, I think, well thought out um, as a writer, director. Of course, you know, the first time around, I didn't want to lose any of the dialogue. Uh, <laughs> the second time around, I said, you know, let's cut this a little faster. And I you know, I just clipped out what we didn't need, but uh, I think it made it better. Yeah, I but, had a, I, as I was watching this film, I had this sense that it was like a, a, another indie version of the time travel movie Primer, which I absolutely love. And I kept getting that if time travel was possible, this would be what would be fucked up in time travel. This is what I. <laughs> this is what would happen. It wouldn't be these paradoxes like in the Avengers. It would be like this. So this well, is you know, I, I went with current uh, string theory, which is, you know, it's parallel dimensions all running at the same time. And uh, to bust through those dimensions, you'll have to go through a wormhole. Mm. And Stephen Hawking said you could, the wormholes exist. They, they open up and close all the time, but they're really tiny and they last for micro fractions of a second you would need a tremendous amount of energy to open one up and so i thought what could open one up and i created the epg which is an electric pulse generator mm -hmm. that's what it does <laughs> <laughs> a great concept uh, uh i i had to ask because i like the i'm a huge sci-fi fan i like anything that tries and does sci-fi in a, a more realistic fashion like I said, I mentioned Primer. Primer is one of my favorite films of all time. Uh, so I like that. I liked your film because of that. I, I got that sense out of it. So uh, do you have any ideals of expanding on this? Or was this just 
this ideal, and now you're moving on to another one because Devil's Food Cake's a horror film, and this one's a sci-fi film. Well, it, it, I I like the concept. Uh, you know, I've been kicking around ideas about what to do with it. Um, I, I think it could go episodic. It could go, you know, sort of a uh, a mini series, maybe five six episodes. Um, it would need a lot more story. And <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I I really do like the I really did like the characters, and uh, I, I I got into it, and the cast I think took them to heart. So cast had a good rapport with the two main cast members. So uh, yeah, they, yeah, they, <laughs> they know each other. You know, they've worked together before. So uh, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> Uh, so moving on, I want to ask some questions about the next one, which is completely different, which is the Devil's Food Cake. Right. So uh, <laughs> that is so different that I have to ask, uh, what 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 made you think of this type of story for your horror movie? Um, well, I mean, your inspiration. Ideas come from all different places, and they generally come in bits and pieces, and they all coalesce. Um, <laughs> Being in Kansas City, um, I spent a little time up in the Ozarks where the film actually takes place. And I saw these little roadhouses, these isolated little places. And so that just sort of stuck in my head as a setting. Um, uh, I was working on a a film that completely fell apart in pre-production and it had a waitress in it. And uh, so I was so pissed off that I could not get that film done that I said, okay, I've got a waitress uniform. Hmm, what could I do with it? So uh, I started thinking about the Ozarks and uh, 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 I had also seen a a film, a documentary called Jesus Camp. I don't know if anybody's seen that, but it's about kids in uh, Lee Summit, Missouri, who are really heavily indoctrinated into uh, evangelism, and people are claiming to see devils, and they're, they're, you know, it's it's the it's the overwhelming sort of feeling that evil is around you. I personally don't feel it. I don't know if you feel. I don't think you feel it, but I personally don't feel it. But the concept of it, um, you know, sort of got into my head, yeah. and then I thought, okay. Uh, being like a Twilight Zone, and every sci-fi story, even a horror movie, is a what-if kind of story. Mm-hmm. What if the last customer of the night was the devil? And I took that concept and just ran with it. Uh, <laughs> you know, I had uh, um, I had an actress in mind for it. Uh, I had the uh, traveler role, the the devil role. Um, I had that actor in mind as well. Um, and I uh, tried to put in a little film noir kind of timing. It's, you know, between them, the pattern between them is a little faster and a little spicier than, you know, most people would talk. But uh, um, uh, that intrigued me as well. And I just sort of go where the story goes and see where the conflicts are and see where the obstacles are uh and there's this is a a story with twists i mean i don't uh i'm definitely throwing some curveballs and by throwing the curveballs hopefully people can maybe explore their own concepts or uh or beliefs uh, about what is truly evil or what is the afterlife going to be like uh, that's kind of why I like genre because you can sort of you can you can tell a story and yet you can sort of get to the subtext of something. Yeah. Is that too much? Too big an answer? <laughs> no, no, that's good. <laughs> no, that's good because when you mentioned Twilight Zone, it didn't dawn on me that's exactly what this feels like as an episode of the Twilight Zone, especially in regards to like your waitress and the last customer of the night being the devil. Uh, I actually, this, I, I, this was very different for me. I, when I was watching them, I didn't realize that they were both done by you, the same person, uh, cause they were so different. 
um, because there's a lot more comedy, in my opinion, in the Devil's Food Cake than there was in Eat. <laughs> there is. There is. There's a, like... It has a dark sense <laughs> of humor. <laughs> It does, especially in regards to the, the, the husband who's at the, the bar. I was like, oh, this is interesting. <laughs> I was like, you have relationship issues. She has, uh, you know, double issues. Mm-hmm. She, yeah, she has all kinds of issues. She has some issues. But it that allows you to be thrown for a loop with the twist because – you don't know what's going on, really, because she's not really stable either. So yeah, I mean, who's really, who's really the perpetrator of uh, <laughs> evil here? You know, who's really reacting? And you know, it's funny because some audiences just because they hear devil's food cake and they think, oh, is that guy's supposed to be the devil. They're still focused on him, sort of being evil. I mean, you kind of look at it; he's trying to help her out. <laughs> and she just will not take the hint <laughs> yeah i really I, I, so uh how, how long did that one take you to film because uh, uh okay we shot devil's food cake um five to six days i want to say hmm, okay five day, no six days i'll say six days um we shot the bar um the first afternoon that evening we shot all through the night at a farm location that i found um and we had this great old spooky dilapidated barn which no longer exists because it just like crumbled after we left uh the uh uh so we shot every night there um i was going to shoot some of the exterior scenes the chase scenes there too but uh it, for that particular time of year, poison ivy was everywhere. And so it's like, well, we got to change location. So for some of the some of the chase at the end, we shifted over about oh, two miles away to another location at four in the morning in a residence. And nobody even knew we were there. And had big trucks and lights and everything. So we just went in and went out. And, uh, and the last thing we had to shoot was uh, the car interior. And the sun was coming up and I thought, Oh no. So we tried to stay on some shady streets and we had the car, you know, on a trailer and we were going through and, and I was in the, the, I was in the cab of the truck, you know, listening with the, uh, the AD and, uh, everything looked good. You know, the sound mixer gave me a big thumbs up, but I thought it's kind of light uh it doesn't look like night and um but i thought i bet my editor can pull me out of this and <laughs> i just said i just trusted him and i you know i got in touch with him right afterwards and i said this is what happened can you make it look like night and he said short answer yes <laughs> 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 it took him a little work, but I think it, I think he really pulled it off. It was a terrific job. Um, we then had to shoot. The last thing we shot were all the car exteriors, the car driving and moving. And, um, you know, that car was try to find a late model car that looks that good. It was really tough. Hmm. Uh, uh, and a lot of people who are car collectors, they, don't want their cars used for anything. They don't no rain, no and do nothing, you know. Uh, and to, so we uh, uh, we got a hold of this car. It was terrific. And the last night we just drove it around and took some great shots. So it's you oh, know, nice. black, black and shiny, and it's great, you know. Has a lot of great production value to the overall film. I'll say that. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, so <laughs> I, I, I'm curious uh, how for everyone to hear about this, because um, you're the first person I'm, I'm talking to about this. How okay. is the film industry or indie film industry where you live in Kansas? Tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, what are some of the difficulties you see versus some of the, the, the um, good things about shooting there? OK, well, uh, definitely. Um... The uh, people, the community, they're, it's very collegiate. 
they're very supportive. You know, people need equipment to loan it out to each other. We have film organizations that are just set up to bring people in. Uh, there's something called the Independent Film Coalition that just brings people in if they're even interested and just starts to get them going. Um, uh, the big drawback is, and Georgia seems to have solved that, uh, is a, a tax incentive for larger productions. Um, Missouri had it, then they let it uh, let it go to sunset in, in, uh, in the state house and they haven't really brought it back again. Kansas City has a, itself has a film incentive, but nothing like, you know, a statewide incentive. Um, that's trouble, that's a, that, that proves to be tr troublesome bringing productions in from the outside and we still get some, but uh, in terms of uh, homegrown uh, productions, there people are shooting all the time. Every weekend, there they've got to be five, six productions going on at the same time. Um, and we have some, we have some great directors. We have a, we have a, some really dedicated, uh, st wonderful actors, SAG and non-union. Um, we have. Uh, almost everything we need here, uh, except some of the wonderful infrastructure that I hear Atlanta has with uh, sound stages. We have, we do have, we shoot on the best equipment, the latest equipment, like everybody else. Uh, and there's a pride here. I mean, it's it, there's a, a kind of a, a very friendly competition, but you know, we just kind of spur each other on, and uh, uh, you know, I. I went to film school and I really liked that experience because it's the same, everybody helping everybody out. And uh, I mean, that's how you do your best work. Uh, so uh, I would say the best thing about Kansas City is that people are very comfy. Once they, once they get here, they can blend right into the, the community. That, that that's great to hear because uh you know like i said i've never heard the, the i had never heard how the film industry in missouri is in kansas city and so <clears throat> hearing feedback from you know like uh filmmakers like you who have been working over there and, uh, and kind of seeing the indie film industry grow is great because hopefully you know um i i have to look up um how many film festivals are actually in missouri and hopefully that there's you know they're growing and hopefully fostering this 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 growing community of filmmakers you know it's you, you're right the the tax incentives are crazy here in georgia which is why we have the, we now have the infrastructure with all the sound stages and stuff but you got to remember that had to come from somewhere which is okay. it all had to start with the indie filmmakers we have tons of we have tons of film festivals here that were here before the film industry decided to blow up uh so hopefully the same thing can happen there because um, you know we have about five film festivals in the area. Okay. Um, we have the Kansas City uh, Film Fest International. We have the Kansas International Film Festival. Uh, <laughs> we have uh, uh, there's something called oh, I can't remember what, what it is right now. Um, there's a, a festival in Wichita. There's uh, now going to be a festival in Columbia, Missouri, where University of Missouri is. Um, oh, okay. And, uh, you know, it's, it, it's, and plus, we like to send our films out into the world. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, now you can, you know, you have internet, you have streaming, you can get an audience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I won't disagree. And, with and you. you know what? I, this is a festival like something wicked excites me because this is a genre specific audience and they're just locked and loaded. They want to, they want to see this. So that's, that's what I'm hoping. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I, I used to do a regular film festival for this one for three years and uh, we, we didn't know who our audience was regular filmmakers genre filmmakers and no one knew because it was so big it didn't know it, it didn't have an identity which is why we started this one like we know who we're going after we're going after the genre filmmakers 
the ones that do the horror, the sci-fi, the fantasy, animation, and experimental films, the stuff that you're not going to necessarily find at all the international film festivals. And so we can shine a light on some of the uh, some of you guys who have the smaller films like e EPG and The Devil's Food Cake and a plethora of other films that we with, that we decide to screen that you probably wouldn't wouldn't most people wouldn't even give the time of day at the international film festival. Don't look, get me wrong. I love international film festival. That's, that's yeah. where my love came from originally. But I also like the fact that I can come to one little event and see a bunch of genre films. But it's the filmmakers I like to meet because the filmmakers, you guys are excited about this stuff. I like to see that. <laughs> you know, I like to see the I like to see the filmmakers who are out there. All I get all the the the, the, the sci-fi uh, block of filmmakers all talking about the latest sci-fi thing, and then I got the, uh, the experimental filmmakers over on this corner, and they're all talking about stuff that no one understands, but it's visually stunning. You know, those are the type of conversations I have with the filmmakers that I love to have. So, you know. I will say one thing about the bigger competitions and some of the competitions that you were talking about that run the gamut. Entertainment is not a dirty word. You mm -hmm. know, it's, you can tell a good story. You can get involved. You can talk about politics, uh, you, relationships, whatever you want, but within the genre. And you can deliver. And, you know, I like the audience experience. Um, I, mm -hmm. wrote, well, I did a lot of comedy and I wrote a lot of comedy. And, and so it's fun to hear somebody reacting to that. And to go into a theater and hear the audience sort of, you know, gasp at the right place, and, you know, scream out a little bit at the right place. And I said, you know, and I'm very conscious of the audience. Experience. Okay, that worked, that worked, that worked. <laughs> so, uh, and when, if somebody laughs at the wrong place, I'm like, what, how, where did I go right? Well, what happened? Why is that funny? Uh, uh, yeah, I love the audience experience. It's really exciting. Yeah. Well, we're definitely uh, happy to be bringing something back this year. Right. <laughs> uh, you know, we we you know we have no you know aspirations at, for this year. I mean, this year other than just to be able to bring films to Georgia audiences. Um, right. We've had a, everyone. Everyone has had a very long year and a half slash two years of being locked up and only watching streaming movies. I mean, we did our sister uh, film festival, the DocuFest, streaming only. You know, it was it was okay reception wise, but it's because it was streaming and everybody's streaming and. It kind of gets a little cluttered out there. So I'm glad to be back and doing a, a real film festival, but I will always love talking to the filmmakers about their films, no matter where in the world they are. I mean, <laughs> you're, you're probably the closest person to Georgia that I've spoken to. I've spoken to a couple of California people now, uh, UK, once was in Israel, and... I'm trying to count them all on my fingers. Oh, Canada. We had a couple of filmmakers from Canada this year uh, that we've already spoken to. So you're the cl closest I to think, Georgia. I, I, will, uh, I will make this claim that <laughs> after these films appear in your festival, other Kansas City filmmakers are going to be hip to something wicked and you're going to see a lot more coming well, up. Well... I, I want. I, I I definitely want to see more films from uh, the Kansas City, Missouri area. <laughs> now that I know there's just people making films, I'm like, thank God there's people making films over there. Because the uh, like I said, you I just don't hear about it that often. I'm like, well, I'm hoping I get to show some films from all from people filmmakers from all over because you know we know people are there making films. Right. We know you're they're, they're making films. In Utah, well, everybody knows there's filmmakers in Utah, but there's probably some filmmakers up in North Dakota. There's, you know, there's, there's filmmakers up in. I'm trying to think of some more uh, states. I don't, Illinois. Uh, I just, I just haven't seen them yet, and I'm hoping, you know, I'll get to see whatever they, what stories they come up with. So, if you, I mean, the good thing is, if you're in a city that actually makes, well, uh, beyond Hollywood films, they make commercials and industrials mm -hmm. and uh, look no one goes into this business because they want to shoot a toothpaste commercial you know you go in because you want to tell the story 
And so, uh, you know, if I can get the guys who are doing excellent work on the toothpaste commercial, and bring them over to my side. <laughs> They're happy. I'm happy. And, you know, it's, it's a, a great experience for everybody. That, that, that is a great way of putting it. That is a great way of putting it. Well, uh, uh, do you have anything else to tell us about either one of your films or both films without revealing too much to the audience? Cause I want them to actually go see your movies. Um, I will say this, um, both films have, uh, uh, a sense of suspense. They're both meant to engage you. And, uh, uh, I don't see, uh, the audience as, uh, you know, some faces beyond the screen. Mm. I'm presenting it to an audience it to have them have a personal experience, make sure I'm trying to connect to them. Uh, you know, I, and I said it before, uh, you know, film is two dimensional, it's flat, mm -hmm. but there is a third dimension and that's emotion. And if you can reach out beyond the flat screen, then you have a film, then it works. Well, excellent. I did, Forget one question I have to know. Okay. <laughs> I, how, how did you get into the film industry? How did you, what, what, what is your background with this? All right. Um, I, uh, uh, I started out writing uh, comedy and I uh, put together, I had a comedy magazine in Boston. Long story, very short. I applied to film school. And uh, so I went, I got a, a grad degree from USC Film School. Oh. And from there, I started working on screenplays and I was kind of a script doctor. And I was also trying to shop my own work at the same time. Uh, cut to, you know, uh, 15, 16 years later, um, I moved to Kansas City because of a girlfriend. My girlfriend said, you know, I live there, I live in Kansas City, you live out there and it's long distance and what do you think? And I thought, <laughs> you know, the, I used to go on a dozen meetings, people were crazy about meetings. And then at one point, because of email and the internet, nobody <laughs> took meetings anymore. And I could email scripts and I, now you have Zoom and it's like, I don't really have to be there. So uh, I came out, I started teaching screenwriting at a college and, um, you know, uh, um, I wanted to get into filmmaking and I was kicking it around and seeing how I could do it. And I stumbled onto the Kansas City Film Festival, or I'm sorry, the film community. I didn't even know they were here. And when I, I mean, you know, I, I went to a couple of 48 hour film festivals and I sort of met people and I said, wow, there's some really good work here. Uh, and and uh, from that, um, my life kind of changed when I saw an interview with Ed Burns, who did Brothers McMullen and so yeah. So he was having trouble getting a film off the ground. And he said, I'm just going to shoot it myself digitally. And he said, there's no reason not to make a film now. And I said, you are right, Ed Burns. And so I got a camera uh got some gear together just started playing around with the camera meeting people and you know uh a couple of years later i was shooting um uh, epg <laughs> yeah keep that spirit of ed burns because he has not stopped shooting even though you know his bigger films have slowed tremendously he's still shooting those indie films so i yeah. i commend him uh, yeah, digital filmmaking, the <laughs> best, the best. Always keep shooting. Just shoot, shoot, shoot. Yep. So, uh, you know, I have another project I'm, I'm putting together and uh, I spend a lot. Of, I'm hopefully trying to get a, a feature off the ground. That's where I'm. Nice. Uh, right. And to make it easy on myself, uh, it's a Western. So. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I'm always a glutton for punishment. They say, why are you always shoot at night? Why are we always shooting overnight? I say, <laughs> Because that's when scary stuff happens. It's nighttime. You know, it's a, well, okay, we're going to shoot during the day. Western. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Wow. Okay. So uh, hopefully we'll see that one. Uh, that will be. Try to work me in there. <laughs> but the thing is, our, our our other film festival, our Something Wicked Fan Fest, I specifically have a category for westerns because there's not one in most film festivals I actually go to, and I wanted to put a, a shine a little light on westerns. So <laughs> should you? Finish it, and it, whether it be a short or fe a feature, by all means, let us know, and we will definitely put it uh, with the, uh, something I mean, we can fan fest. I'm in the West. This is this was the Wild West. This Jesse James was over in Independence, <laughs> you know, and people say, oh, yeah, look, uh, yeah. and they can point out where robberies were, and, and you know, what I, what I liked was existing structures. There are still, like, Western sets, and uh, you know, Merchant Ivory um, always shot those great European, you know, uh, period pieces. They never built one set. They never built anything. They got some costumes and they <laughs> went to shoot at a palace. I said, I can do that. It's cheap. <laughs> That's how he kept it cheap. Right. <laughs> That's how you you got to, you know, you got to think about the budget when, you, when you're writing and when you're shooting. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, it has been a pleasure talking with you, Andrew. Uh, we wish you nothing but, uh, you know, great success with this, these two films at film festivals. Um, please keep us in, uh, in the loop about <clears throat> where else they might be screening and whatever projects you have coming up next, because what we'll do is we'll just post it on our social media sites. We always like to keep it in, in, in line with all of our filmmakers and try and promote them as much as possible why we this is also why we have these interviews so uh by all means i'm i'm happy to be a part of it and if anyone wants to uh throw a question my way i have a website quickfingerfilms.com it's q i k fingers it's q i k fingerfilms.com so <laughs> it's at the end of the film i'm sure you could you'll you'll see it just write it down and you can find it. you can Google me too. I'll show up. Just remember <laughs> this goofy face, and you'll see me. So, uh, anyway, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. You're welcome, and uh, I will see you in your next film. Okay. Terrific. Take care. Uh, have a good evening. You too. Thanks. <laughs>